Member statements. I recognize the member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Speaker. It is a pleasure to rise today and discuss one of the most pressing issues in this province, standing up for and protecting our seniors. Seniors build our communities and they help make this province what it is today. This government continues to fail seniors. Seniors in my riding are struggling to find affordable housing. Many are far facing the harsh reality of greedy corporate companies that force rent evictions and then leave them struggling to find a place to live that they can afford. Unfortunately, this government has done nothing to stop these rent evictions and skyrocketing housing costs. In order to protect and support seniors, the cost of everything is rising. Hydro, gas, food are not affordable for seniors who are on fixed income. This is an affordability crisis. During the pandemic, we saw the grave reality of an underfunded health care system and a for-profit long-term care system. Nearly 5,000 seniors died from COVID-19 in long-term care and retirement homes. You'd think that would be a lesson for this government, and they would change a flawed system in order to take care of our seniors, but that didn't happen. They saw the military report seniors dying from dehydration, and they've done nothing to fix a broken long-term care system. Instead, they continue to find new ways to privatize our health care system, including long-term care, home care, and now surgeries. This government has failed seniors. Seniors in this province deserve so much better. They deserve a government that will address the affordability crisis and ensure they have the health and long-term care they need to be able to age with dignity. Thank you. Member Statements. The member for Sarnia Lambton. Sure. It's my pleasure to rise in the Legislature today and update you and the House on the additional supports being made available by the Government of Ontario to combat homelessness in Sarnia Lambton. It's an honour to announce today that the Government is investing an additional $25 million annually in new homelessness prevention program, which will help more people find the right housing services and other supports. This new program includes a 2022-23 investment of nearly $3.6 million for the County of Lambton Homelessness Initiatives, an increase of more than $200,000 from the previous allocation. Additionally, Mr. Speaker, the new program introduced by the government will simplify and streamline operations. This will allow municipal service managers to spend less time on paperwork and more time working with their clients to help find housing and other supports, as well as how helping those at risk of homelessness stay in their homes. This critical funding will address the growing challenge of homelessness in Lampton County and will help to ensure everyone in our community has a place, place to call home. It's no secret that our government inherited a homelessness prevention system that was cumbersome and complicated. The existing system was administered through several different government programs and was overly underfunded, fragmented, and overly complex. It's heartening to see that with Ontario's new homelessness prevention program, our government is simplifying the delivery of services and increasing funding. That will allow our municipal partners, like the County of Lamp, to spend more time focusing on providing vulnerable Ontarians with the supports they need to stay in their homes or get the housing they need. Thank you. York Southwest. Speak, um, uh, it is an honour to once again rise and speak on behalf of the decent and hardworking people of York Southwestern. Our community is home to many frontline essential workers that sacrificed so much and carried us through the pandemic, while often receiving little in return while putting themselves and their families at risk during the worst of the pandemic. The pandemic has only highlighted the inequities and disparities that exist. In York Southwestern, families, seniors and young people are struggling. We are in a serious housing crisis where rents are unaffordable. People are afraid to move from their current units and the dream of owning a home where you grow up is only a dream. Auto insurance rates due to the postal discrimination mean as we pay some of the highest rates in the country. While insurance companies delivered no relief as cars stayed parked during the pandemic, gas prices get closer to $2, and minimum wage is simply inadequate. Mr. Speaker, the official opposition has tabled many concrete plans on dealing with affordability and cost of living solutions, and this government has ignored them. While this current government doesn't want to or cannot get things done when it comes to helping those most at need, we deserve better, and the folks of York Southwestern, Mr. Speaker, deserve better. Thank you.
Thank you. Member Statements. The member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. This past Sunday, I was honoured to be invited to the grand opening of the brand new North End Islamic Centre in Brantford. The Muslim community in Brantford has a very deep and rich history spanning multiple generations, going back into the 1890s. During this grand opening, Speaker, I spoke with children and grandchildren of the founders of the Muslim Association of Brantford and learned of the many philanthropic projects that have been spearheaded by Brantford's Muslim community. This new space will be used by members of the Muslim community for prayers and quiet contemplation, and all will be welcomed to use this space for community purposes, meetings, and also moments of self-reflection and share what is ailing the community and what is making us happy. Current President of the Muslim Association of Brantford, my friend Nasser Hamed, and past President Anwar Dost repeatedly echoed their community's love and gratitude for Canada, for Ontario, and our community, and their wish for unity and understanding among all. So if you are in the north part of Brantford and would like to drop in and say hello, you will be pressed to find a warmer welcome and kinder smiles than here. The association's president, Nasser Hamad, said, Muslim chose Brantford because Brantford is the best place to live, work, play, and raise a family in Ontario. And, Speaker, I could not agree with him more. Brantford Brant is the best place to live, work, play, and raise a family. Thank you. Thank you. Member Statements. The member for Parkdale High Park. Speaker, Ontario is in the midst of an unprecedented housing crisis. Housing prices have increased by 44 per cent in the last two years. The average price of a single-family home in Toronto has now passed the $2 million mark. Affording a home in Ontario is an impossibility for most people. We know that housing supply is a key part of the solution, but that supply, which right now is limited, is being mopped up by factors that make it impossible for individuals to compete. Transparency International found that in just 10 years, $28.4 billion of housing in the GTA alone was bought anonymously. Toronto is a global hotspot for money laundering. Last year, Core Development announced their plans to buy up a billion dollars in single-family homes. How are hard-working people who live and pay taxes here supposed to compete with shady capital from money laundering or capital from corporations who don't even pay the same rates of taxes and have access to cheaper funding sources. It's not an even playing field. No government, conservative or liberal, has done anything to fix this injustice. My bill, sorry, so yes, supply is key to addressing the housing crisis, but we also have to play even the playing field. My bill, the Anti-Money Laundering and Housing Act, targets exactly this. I invite anyone in this House to debate it and tell me what in this bill doesn't make sense. And if you don't find anything there, then pass the damn bill. Thank you. Member Statements. The member for York Centre. Speaker, the Premier broke every promise he made to voters four years ago. He campaigned on the slogan for the people, but failed the people. He campaigned on ending hallway health care. Instead, he ended health care. He promised to reduce hydro rates by 12 percent, but hydro rates are up. He said that he'll reduce auto insurance rates, but they're much higher. He promised that no parents of children with autism would have to demonstrate on the front lawn. The autism waitlist has more than doubled, while families have been waiting for four years for this government to, quote, get it right. The Premier campaigned with me on the Shepherd subway, but agreed to the John Tory light rail. He campaigned on restoring accountability to government. Instead, he invoked the notwithstanding clause for the first time in Ontario's history on a self-serving elections legislation. He uses taxpayer dollars to pay for what are clearly partisan ads months before an election. He campaigned on efficiency, but now runs the party of yes. He says he'll stand up for the little guy, but tens of thousands are fired or suspended because of mandates, despite him being against a two-tier society. But nothing comes close to the harm he caused Ontarians with some of the harshest and, lockdown and longest lockdowns in the world. The Premier knew of the harms since late 2020. He repeatedly said that he agrees with me on COVID response, but he didn't have the courage to oppose the narrative or defend Ontarians. He bears responsibility for the lives lost due to surgeries delayed, cancer screenings missed, and the rise in overdose. 
This shall be the shameful legacy of this Premier. Next member statement. The Thank member you. for Speaker. Hastings, Lennox and Addington. It's a recreational league designed to help young families play hockey at a truly affordable price. Karen and Harold Bailey started this league back in 1991 with borrowed sweaters and a 45-person roster of young people. On May 13, 1993, a tragic industrial accident claimed the life of one of the most popular coaches, Bruce Lee, and with the family's permission, the House League was renamed in his honour. This league has been operating for 33 years. Just think, Karen and Hale, Harold Bailey have spent every Friday night possible in the Maydock Arena for the last 33 years, continuing to support the youth in our community. What a tremendous accomplishment. Recently, the league was entered into the Kara Hockey, the next Strides Hockey vaccination campaign, and they won the grand prize of $10,000. So we think it would end there. Not if you know the volunteerism of Karen and Harold Bailey. Last week, they announced that they would be donating a large portion of that prize money to other youth organizations in the community. They presented a check for $2,000 to Center Haitian Grizzlies Minor Hockey. They announced that they'd be supporting a local baseball team, a swimming pool, a new ball hockey team, dancing, and even their work with the church. So thank you to Harold and Carol Bailey for everything you do and have done and continue to do for our community. It's my honor to be your friend. Thank you very much. You. Member statements. The member for Essex. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. With your indulgence, Speaker, uh, this may be my last opportunity uh, as a member of provincial parliament before I leave this distinguished house uh, to offer a member statement. And I'd like to uh, thank so many people that allowed. Uh, me to be here, that worked so hard for me to be here. First and foremost, my parents, uh, my late father, Boris, and my mother, Sheila, who instilled the values in me to fight for those who could not fight for themselves. And uh, that's what drives me, and it always has. My uh, siblings, uh, my sister Susie, my brother Michael, and Eddie, uh, who uh, are incredible uh, you know, people and, and in, uh, inspired me along the way. My wife Jenny and my kids Erica and Drake, who gave me nothing but love and support throughout uh, the last uh, 11 years of my career, my uh, constituency team, Jody, Percy, Patty Hayes, Nolan Hennon, uh, Katrina Verbeek, and Merv Richards, who uh, dedicated their lives to supporting our constituents and fighting for them. Uh, to the people of Essex County who have uh, entrusted me to carry their voice and to fight for their concerns in this place, I am forever honoured uh, by their support. Uh, and uh, the, uh, to my colleagues, here uh, on the NDP side, who I've made lifelong friendships with and who have inspired me uh, my entire life. Uh, I am so honoured to, uh, to have had this opportunity. Uh, to the people uh, who keep this building going, uh, lead security, our uh, esteemed media, the free press, all those that keep the building moving, uh, I am so thankful for them. Uh, to my colleagues from all parties, uh, each and every day, uh, we walk past the marble walls and we see those that came before us. And sometimes I rub my fingers across the names, the, engraving, uh, the engravings, uh, particularly the late Bruce Crozier, my predecessor, a uh, speaker who you served with as well, and uh, the late Pat Hayes. And I feel uh, their spirit and I feel their responsibility that they carried. And I know each and every one of you carry that same responsibility. So we are on the cusp of an upcoming election. Uh, I wish you all the very best. It has been an honour to serve in this place with you, uh, despite our differences, despite uh, our challenges, despite the conflicts that may be perceived. This small little aisle, this space separates us, but it doesn't separate us uh, between the values that we carry in this house, to serve people, to do our best, and to make this province a better place to live. It has been the honour of my life to serve in this House, and I wish you all, from the bottom of my heart, the very best in the upcoming election, uh, and, and I want to thank you all uh, for this experience. I've learned so much in this place. You cannot give 
more than you receive. In fact, the more you give, the more you receive. Maybe that is the lesson that I've learned throughout my career. So I ask you all to continue to give more than you possibly can imagine to give, because undoubtedly you will receive more and the people of this province will be better off because of your efforts. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. The next member statement, the member for Niagara West. Thank you very much, Speaker. Since coming to office in 2018, the Ontario PC government, under the leadership of Premier Ford, have remained committed to ensuring strong protections for religious freedoms in Ontario, including the protection of our religious diversity in every corner of this province. Later today, the House will have the opportunity to debate Bill 89, the Protecting Ontario's Religious Diversity Act 2022. Speaker, I believe that all of us in this House share a commitment to the protection of our fundamental rights in Canada. We share a common belief in the necessity of protecting Ontarians' rights to ensure that they are able to live freely and in peace while recognizing the importance of personal responsibility for the people of this province. Now, the way we arrive at promoting and defending these rights and responsibilities varies depending on our political philosophies. The road we believe should be followed in doing so can also vary, given our life experiences, histories and backgrounds. But one of the very crucial and fundamental rights that we have as Canadians and Ontarians is the freedom of religion. Bill 89, the Protecting Ontario's Religious uh, Diversity Act, will add religious expression as prohibited grounds to the Ontario Human Rights Code, ensuring that all Ontarians can rest secure in practicing their faith without fear of harassment or discrimination. Adding religious expression as prohibited grounds for discrimination is broadly supported across diverse religious backgrounds in Ontario, and this addition will testify to our support as a legislature for the rich pluralism and diversity of religious beliefs in our province, especially for our religious minorities. Adding religious expression to the Human Rights Code as prohibited grounds will provide a meaningful tool for those who are targeted or discriminated against due to their religious expression in a wide variety of contexts. And I know that many members will be supporting this legislation, and I look forward to the debate later this afternoon. Thank you very much. That concludes our members' statements for this morning. I beg to inform the House that, pursuant to Standing Order 9G, the clerk has received written notice from the government house leader indicating that a temporary change in the weekly meeting schedule of the house is required and therefore the afternoon routine on wednesday march 30th 2020 shall commence at 1 p.m <coughs> government house leader has a point of order uh, thank you mr speaker mr. Uh, mr speaker i believe if you seek it you will find unanimous consent to allow members to make statements in remembrance for the late mr marvin leonard shore uh, with five minutes allotted to Her Majesty's uh, loyal opposition, five minutes allotted to the independent members as a group, and five minutes allotted to Her Majesty's government. The House Leader is seeking unanimous consent of the House to allow members to make statements in remembrance of the late Marvin Leonard Shore. With five minutes allotted to Her Majesty's loyal opposition, five minutes allotted to the independent members as a group, and five minutes allotted to Her Majesty's government. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. We'll begin with the member for London North Centre. Thank you, Speaker. I arrive today to mark the passing of Marvin Leonard Shore back on September the 26th of 2019. I'd like to welcome Marv's loving partner, Cecile, grandchildren, Shalom, Simha, great grandson, Noam, friends like Larry. Mark, Stephanie, Andrea, Howard, Alan, Greg, and Steve, who are all in attendance today. I'd also like to recognize Marv's three sons, David, Raphael, and Ephraim, and 19 other grandchildren. Shalom Aleichem. It comes as a little comfort, but it's been said that the most righteous people pass at the time when Marv did. Marv was a real mensch a man of character who really marched to the beat of his own drum. In this hyper-partisan, hyper color-coded political world, people like Marv are refreshing, while perhaps a bit of a headache for the powers that be. 
Marv was a member of this great house from 1975 through 1977. A big and positive personality came to shock to many that as a longtime Conservative, Marv decided to run as a star candidate for the Liberals in my riding of London North, now London North Centre. But Marv wasn't afraid of his opinion and backed Stuart Smith from Hamilton in the leadership contest for the Liberal Party and probably made it pretty awkward with London Centre MPP David Peterson. Marv eventually crossed the floor and was accepted warmly, but unfortunately lost his re-election bid. At the time, he stated, as an economic conservative, I have found after a year that I cannot be as comfortable as I hoped with the Liberal Party of Ontario. It's that kind of bold character, that obedience to one's principles, and standing up for what he believes that distinguishes him. In standing up for his beliefs, I can only imagine what he had to deal with. As I reviewed every last word of his through Hansard in the 30th Parliament, I also saw, unfortunately, many of the negative attacks he endured. I'm thankful that we have the opportunity to review his words in this chamber. You don't necessarily get to know a person from their words, but you're definitely given a sense of them. What is most apparent from his words are his intellect, his wit, his humour, and the strength of his beliefs. He believed that housing and education should be top priorities and that the province should give back to municipalities as much as possible. His, ver his words are very true up to this day. Marv's career was vast. Please accept my apologies, as I'm quite certain I will miss some of his extensive service record. As a Chartered Accountant, he was a member of the Public Relations Committee of the Western Ontario Chartered Accountants Association, elected Fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountants Association of Ontario, Chair of the Board of Education in London, worked with the Boy Scouts of Canada, member on the London Chamber of Commerce, London Jewish Community Council, London Squash and Rackets Club, London Hunt and Country Club, Masonic Order of Canada, Board of Governors of Or Shalom Synagogue, Alumni Association of the University of Western Ontario, and Big Brothers of London. It makes you wonder where Marv found the time. Clearly, he believed in giving back to his community. It's through our actions, our dedication to our communities, that one may be honoured and remembered. Upon reading Marv's words in this chamber, and with this House's indulgence, I'd like to let his words ring out here once more. He was a funny man. When the Speaker said, order please, we're wasting valuable time in the question period here, Marv said, I'm paid by the season, Mr. Speaker, so I'm okay. <laughs> he also had great lines like, don't let the facts bother you. I might borrow that one for myself one day. <laughs> and when, when a member kept stumbling over his speech, Marv asked, who wrote it for you? <laughs> and after some interjections in one reply, he said, let whoever wrote it for you read it then. <laughs> so. In an exchange with David Peterson, the MPP for London Centre, who pointed out the debt, the deficit, the debt burden, the deficit, and tried to emphasize Marv's views for him with, and Marvin Shore agrees with me. Marvin Shore agrees with us. Another MPP stated, yes, Marvin is a very agreeable chap. To which Marv replied, that is the only part I agree with. <laughs> so as I continue, and there are so many different things I would love to say that Marv had to say in this chamber. Unfortunately, I see that the clock is running out of time. <clears throat> We're joined here today by one of Marv's oldest and best friends, Larry Pakin. Larry and Marv met while attending the University of Western Ontario and lived together in the 1950s while attending school. The fact that they remained so close for so long, even after living together, is a testament to Marv's character. 70 years is a friendship like no other. If members haven't already done so, I'd like to recommend the truly beautiful article by Steve Pakin, who's also a guest here in the House today. I placed some copies in the members' lounges, both on the government side and in the opposition side, because this article really captures the dynamism, humour and heart of Marv Shore. My only hope today is that the speeches from the government, the opposition and the independent members capture a brief glimmer of what Steve was able to convey in his writing. If we do so, it will be called a great success. It's a rare and exceptional quality in a person when someone who is your parent's friend also becomes your friend. This rare quality shows Marv's warmth, intellect, and genuine good, good nature. We are made better in this world by the company we keep and the relationships we foster. I think the best measure of a person is in how they are known by the ones who love them most. While my entire speech today could, could have been Steve's article, I'll leave that to all of you to read and hopefully not spoil some of the best bits. 
One of the parts I liked best was how the Pakin boys would call each other Marv, their father Larry Marv, how Steve's kids call him Marv to this very day. It speaks to the mark that some people make upon us, our lives, and on our hearts. It's as though his humor and character would live on in a simple, loving gesture. Good writing captures the quality of a person, while excellent writing captures their essence. It gives a brief glimpse into a life, a heart, and what it means to love. I hope that you all are able to get a photo with Marv's engraving in the wall today. As I begin to close off, I'd like to quote another great poet and author, Khalil Gibran. When you are sorrowful again, or when you are sorrowful, look again into your heart, and you shall see that in truth you are weeping for that which has been your delight. Condolences to David, Raphael, and Ephraim on the loss of your beloved father, as well to, to Marv's many grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Thank you for sharing Marv with us, Cecile. Thank you for your tireless campaigning alongside him. From this side of the house, please accept our condolences on his passing and our great respect for a life well-lived and to a man well-loved, a person all his own. On behalf of the official opposition and with all of the members today in the legislature, we'd like to say, wow. Marv Shore, London North. <laughs> Nice, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And it's an honour to stand and say a few words of tribute to Marvin Leonard Shore, MPP from London North from 1975 to 1977, a Liberal from September 1975 to August 1976, and a Progressive Conservative from August 1976 to April 1977. So I just want to make it clear, we're going to lay claim to him because he sat longer as a Liberal <laughs> than he did as a Progressive Conservative. It's true. It's true, folks. Got to live with it. You know, I do understand, though, that even his family didn't know he was crossing the floor, so Marvin was probably truly a unique individual, very brave, and uh, kept his own counsel. So more important than whatever happened in here and what transpired, Marvin Shore was a uh, loving husband, father to three boys, and 21 grandchildren, and had many friends. And there's a wonderful tribute uh, to Mr. Shore from a lifelong friend, Steve Pakin, remembering one of Ontario's funniest MPPs. It really helped me to get, someone, to, get to know someone that I'd never met. I really related to the story of Marvin, as you've just heard, being in campaign mode and answering the door Marv Shore, London North, that eventually led to a running joke amongst the Pakin family. So being the object of a number of running jokes in my family and friends, I like to believe that when people tease you while you're not there, it's because they really love you. So I'm going to stick with that. And it's really quite a heartwarming thing to hear about. And thank you, Steve, for sharing that. So here's a quote from, Marvin's, uh, uh, from Marvin in a local paper after his victory in London North. I don't want to just put up my hand when someone tells me to. I'm not built that way. I spent some time as well reading Marvin's Hansard, and it was clear that he had a strong belief in fiscal responsibility and the importance of education. Hansard also revealed that Marvin Shore more than enjoyed a good heckle. Here are some of Marvin's quotes from Hansard from April 21st, 1977. Of course, this is after he went to the dark side. <laughs> the debate was about rent review, and Ian Deans, who I knew, was involved in the debate, so it was really, it's fun to read that stuff and see what went on. And Hansard was really busy in those days, and they didn't have the same technology. So here we go. You may have to burn this speech afterwards. You like everything for free. You've got to see it, you've got to read it first before you see it. Here's my favorite. Take care of your schools, Remo. They need a janitor down there. <laughs> and first time, A. How typically Canadian. So, as I said, you know, in the technology of the day, it's incredible to see how many interjections that Marvin had and that Hansard actually recorded it. And we're all probably lucky 
that it doesn't happen with the frequency that it did in those days. I think all of us enjoy a good heckle. I know that I do. So crossing the floor, it's not an easy thing to do. Political parties, we're like families. So when someone leaves, it's not always nice. It's not always pleasant. But to do it twice, to start as a conservative, go to be a liberal, and then go back to be a conservative, that's like, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> you gotta have a pretty strong constitution to be able to do that and have confidence in yourself and actually have good relationships with people because it can be really hard. So just, just knowing that helped me know who Marvin Shore was. And although he didn't return to the legislature, we were happy to have him on our side for the brief time that we did, as I'm sure my colleagues on the other side would be as well. In those brief two years, Marvin Shore left a mark on this place and the people who served with him. To his wife, Cecile, to his sons, David, Ephraim, and Raphael, to all and his grandchildren, and to all the family and friends gathered here today, it is a real honor to have to say a few words about someone who left a mark in this place, although not spending a lot of time here. And uh, I want to thank you for sharing with us and sharing your stories. Thank you, Speaker. Member for Guelph. To rise to share a few brief words in tribute to Martin Leonard Shore, or Marv Shore, London North, the former Liberal and Conservative MPP. And I want to welcome his family, friends, colleagues for joining us today. Marv's accomplishments were impressive. Serving in the House from 1975 to 1977, his son David remembers Marv as someone who, quote, listened to everyone and didn't agree with anyone. Now, Speaker, <laughs> being willing to listen to people, I believe is a model quality for any polit politician. Although I do believe now and then, occasionally, agreeing with someone is also a good attribute, especially when you earn a reputation as Ontario's funniest MPP. I'm inspired by Marv's commitment to working across party lines in his case, quite literally, crossing party lines, and his dedication to this province and to our country. You know, Speaker, in the cut and thrust of politics, we need more of Marv, more laughs, more fun in this place. And so I want to say to Marv's family, thank you for sharing him with us and the people of Ontario, his service, and his humor. Thank you, Speaker. Member for Whitby. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I'd like to first acknowledge the presence of Mr. Shore's family and friends in the gallery this morning to hear the tributes to the late father, grandfather, and dear colleague. Welcome to Queen's Park. Myron Shore's official obituary points out that, yes, he was a member of the Ontario Legislature for two years. 1995 to 1997, but he was also the chair of the London Board of Education and a chartered accountant before that. But like many of us in this place, Speaker, his involvement with many community organizations in London allowed him to hone his skills, his values, coming to Queen's Park, where he was a liberal critic for finance and he also served on several standing committees of the legislature, social development, public accounts, and estimates. Clearly the most demanding to be assigned to, and where Mr. Shore excelled and did an exceptional job. What stands out for me when reading about Mr. Shore was his love for his family, his staff, and the constituency he had the privilege of serving. 
He clearly strove to maintain balance in his life, having a strong partnership with his wife, Cecile, raising children who were kind, strong, generous. For Mr. Shore, that really was its own reward, its own reward. Now, many will tell you that his modesty made him, you might say, unique in politics. Humility rooted in his strong core values, the values that I spoke of coming out of his community involvement. His strong core values derived from a humble beginning. Some of Mr. Shore's former colleagues described him as the epitome of public service who cared deeply about those he was close with, with every fiber of his being. Former MPP Michael Briot from the adjoining riding of Oshawa had this to say about Mr. Shore. Marvin had a great personality and a good intellect. And usually that makes for a great addition to the legislative process. Colleagues, he certainly was that, and much more. That's who Marvin Shore was, a man speaker who knew what was important and didn't believe in dwelling on what wasn't. Speaking truth from the heart. Speaking truth from the heart. Now, Speaker, whenever my granddaughters, Sophia and Annette, who are watching today, visit Queen's Park, and they haven't been here for, for over two years, we pause for a moment, because they always want to go downstairs. They always want to go downstairs. Well, they want to see, they want to see their grandpa's name on the wall, right? But they want to go downstairs. But we look at all the other names engraved on the walls below this legislative chamber. As Speaker, together we say a prayer, thanking individuals like Marvin Shore for their dedication, their perseverance to public service. What a privilege we have, what a privilege Marvin Shore had to demonstrate his commitment to public service. What those names demonstrate is their lasting legacy of making our province a better place to live and raise our families. Farewell, Marvin Shore. London North never had a greater champion. The province of Ontario is forever indebted for your service. God bless you, your family, and your friends. Public service at its best. Thank the members for their eloquent tributes. Introduction of visitors. It's my honour and pleasure to introduce the family of the late Marvin Leonard Shore, who, as we know, was the MPP for London North during the 30th Parliament. Mr. Shore's family and friends are here with us in the Speaker's Gallery. Marvin's wife, Cecile Shore, grandsons Shalom Shore and Simsha Shore, great grandson Noah Shore, and many friends. Welcome to the Legislative Assembly. Also in the Speaker's Gallery is Ms. Judy Marsalz, MPP for the riding of Hamilton West during the 38th Parliament and the Chair of the Ontario Association of Former Parliamentarians, and Mr. David Warner, Speaker during the 35th Parliament. Welcome. <laughs> Introduction to visitors, the member for Hastings, Lennox and Addington. 
thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm very pleased today to welcome a pair of lifelong friends, my neighbors, of course, from our local community, uh, Doug and Mark McCoy, and beside them, of course, my darling of 51 years, God bless her soul, Carol Ann. Introduction to visitors. <laughs> member, introduction to visitors, the member for Etobicoke Lakeshore. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to welcome today some students from Humber College and their professor. Welcome to the, the welcome to the legislature and enjoy your day. <laughs> member for Ottawa South has informed me that he has a point of order. Thank you very much, Speaker. I'm seeking unanimous consent to move a motion that a meeting of the Standing Committee on Social Policy be convened with regards to the involvement of the Office of the Premier and the Office of the Minister of Health with the dismissal of Dr. Brooks Fallis from the William Osler Health System. Member for Ottawa South is seeking unanimous consent to move a motion. Agreed? No. Heard a no.